Thank you, and uh, I have a timer on the slide set, so I hope that works. Um, okay, so I'll dive into it. Um, so uh, my name is Michael Cooper. I work for the Web Accessibility Initiative. I've worked on the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines for many years, as well as some other technologies. Um, I'll kind of speed through the intro stuff. Uh, uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, it's targeted to content authors. Um, it's part of a, it's a universal uh, set of guidelines, uh, which means uh, it doesn't address some of the specific things that we've been hearing about today with regard to pedagogy. It's something that can be applied to all websites, but it's meant to be a base. It's a, it's a common base on which other things could build. Um, uh, for maximum effectiveness, uh, it, it needs user agent support. Um, so we, we call this accessibility support in, in WCAG 2. Um, it, you know, if, uh, if user agents don't do a certain thing, then authors have to try harder to make the, that thing happen for users with disabilities. Um, so, so there's a great dependence on that. Um, that's uh, reflected to some extent by some of the other guidelines produced by the way, which is the user agent accessibility guidelines 2.0 and the authoring tool accessibility guidelines 2.0. Um, so the three of those guidelines create a sort of a triumvirate of accessibility guidelines. Um, and WCAG 2.0 has been a standard since 2008. Um, so uh, because of that, it's starting to show its age. It's nearly eight years old now. Um, technology and uses changes are start, uh, starting to require a fresh look. Um, uh, it's things like smartphones, uh, uh, web payments, automotive interfaces nowadays, the web of things, social networking, ebooks. These are all things that weren't uh, as big at the time that WCAG 2.0 was finalized. So they're, they're creating new accessibility challenges to address. Um, social networking uh, and wikis are examples of how authoring is more directly embedded into the content now. Um, so there's less of a separation between authoring tools and web content as there used to be. Um, it's also uh, possible to better need the needs of some user groups these days. Um, for instance, cognitive and learning disabilities um, and low vision are two groups that have come forward with uh, new ideas for, for ways that guidelines could address the needs of those groups. Um, so looking to the future, um, I've been proposing for a while that we uh, take a user needs approach, um, which sounds obvious, uh, but uh, it, it's a structured way of looking at how we should move forward with the guidelines. So guidelines should be tied to known user needs. Um, user needs interrelate, so we need a, a comprehensive set of what are all the different types of user needs out there and how can we structure guidelines around them. Um, technology changes sometimes create new needs as well, um, so this is something that we need to continually stay on top of and, and reflect in guidelines. So how do we know what user needs are? Um, traditionally, we've simply relied on our own expertise. Um, you know, those of us who've been working in the industry say, well, we know that uh, blind people need screen readers or braille displays. We know that uh, uh, you know, you know, deaf people need ca captioning, things like that. We, we, we just base it on our own expertise. Um, we also rely a lot on anecdotal reports from users. Um, that is, people saying, you know, here's a need I have, uh, can, can we find a way to address it? Um, I call that anecdotal in uh, particular because uh, we actually hear from a minuscule fraction of the users who are out, who are out there. Um, so we only know uh, what the people who are telling us things uh, say. So that's a somewhat limited base, uh, although an important one. Um, there are various collections of user needs information. So literature review is one uh, important way to, to know what the user needs are, um, although you have to consider the source. Um, optimally, we would know what user needs are via research. Um, uh, that's expensive though, um, so uh, it, it's something that hasn't happened a whole lot. It, it happens in a very piecemeal. One of the other speakers talked about how there was very little uh, uh, you know, cross-validating research available. Um, once you know what the user needs are, uh, you need to figure out how you should meet them in guidelines. Um, uh, there's basically three predominant ways you can meet user needs. One is by features of the content technology itself. So it, it provides a feature that addresses a particular user need. Um, authors can also address user needs uh, via how they, the structure of the site. That can be both by design, um, but also by how they take advantage of the technology features available to them to meet the user need. Um, and then a lot of user needs can be met by user agents. So uh, you know, some things actually require nothing except that the user agent provides some sort of customization feature or some sort of default display feature. 
Um, others require the user agent to work in conjunction with technology features and authors. Um, so all three of these approaches are needed to meet user needs. Um, so it, just to use an example, uh, color contrast uh, is just an example that comes to mind. There are different ways that you might uh, ensure that uh, color contrast is available. Uh, one is that uh, the technology could provide uh, features that allow authors to set the colors in a way that would meet requirements, and then the author would uh, use that feature to, to follow color luminosity guidelines. Um, another way might be that uh, the technology provides uh, color definition features that allow uh, users to override author colors, and then the user agent would support that feature um, and, and provide the, the contrast regardless of what the author did. Um, you might provide uh, you know, semantics, color semantics that can be remapped. The author uh, defines their colors in terms of these semantics rather than the colors, um, and then the user agent uh, supports those semantics uh, in a way that, that's specific to the user's needs. So uh, you, know, you can see that there are, uh, I'm gonna skip through some of the rest of these uh, options, but there, there are different uh, combinations of technology features, um, author action, and user agent features that, that work. Um, sometimes a user, uh, an approach requires all three to work in conjunction. Sometimes only two or one of them is needed. Um, so applying this concept to guidelines development, um, uh, the first thing we need to do is collect a very comprehensive uh, set of information about user needs and identify all the possible ways that they could be met. A as you saw just with a simple example of color contrast, uh, and this was the result of quick brainstorming, and I came up with six possible ways some of which are more straightforward than others, some of which are easier for one group than, uh, than others. So you need to consider uh, the, the pros and cons of each of the possible approaches. Um, you know, it, you know, it might be that it, it's, it's more effective uh, to rely on user agents to expose a feature than to require every single web author to know the color contrast guidelines and apply them properly. Um, but uh, you, you need to, to think about what's gonna be the most effective. Um, and then you build guidelines that collectively cover all the approaches. Um, so we're here identifying that we need neat guidelines that will address technologies themselves as well as authors, which is the classical WCAG model, and user agents. Um, so what we're doing at W3C to, to address this, uh, you know, work up till now has been uh, in documenting user needs. We've started uh, creating a bunch of sort of user needs uh, requirements. The, the first one was media accessibility user requirements, uh, which described how, how describes very comprehensively uh, what the various needs for various uh, people with disabilities have with regard to access to media. We're beginning work on one for web payments as well. Um, brand new work, but uh, you know, very interesting. Um, the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force has published a very large paper on uh, various types of cognitive and learning disabilities. Uh, uh, it's a very comprehensive literature review exposing the needs uh, very specific to this wide variety of disabilities. Um, and we're in the process of forming a, a research questions task force, which is a descendant of the uh, research and development working group um, to uh, provide a research component to that, although it's uh, much smaller than the, the research need that exists is. Um, having identified these needs, we're working on how to address the features um, you know, through technologies such as Accessible Rich Internet Applications, or ARIA. Um, uh, there's proposed work on web technology accessibility guidelines, which would tell specification developers what they need to do to provide features. Um, there's been a lot of interaction with major content languages such as HTML, CSS, um, SVG, digital publishing web payments, to work directly with those uh, technologies and providing features. Um, and we also do weekly reviews to try to catch uh, accessibility needs. Um, to support authors, um, Authoring Tool Accessibility Gay Guidelines uh, recently was finalized. We continually update the WCAG 2.0 techniques, um, and we've begun a process in the past year to work on extensions to WCAG 2.0, um, which would uh, build on top of WCAG 2.0 and provide uh, specific guidance that you could conform to in addition to, not instead of, WCAG 2.0 and we've had work underway for cognitive and learning disabilities, uh, mobile devices, and low vision. Um, for user agents, uh, user agent accessibility guidelines 2.0 also was recently finalized. 
Um, there's also been a lot of work on, going on in uh, describing accessibility API mappings, saying how various technologies should be exposed to accessibility APIs. Um, so right now we have draft mappings for ARIA, HTML, SVG, and digital publishing. So um, in terms of what we would like to do going forwards, we're, we're beginning to explore new work. Um, there's been a proposal for a, a WCAG 2.1, perhaps. Um, there's been a lot of concern that the, uh, the proposed extensions might lead to some fragmentation because um, some entity could say, well, I'm only going to follow the low vision extension and I don't care about the cognitive. Um, uh, the, uh, another might take a different track. So you get a uh, sort of fragmentation of user groups. Um, so there's been a proposal to, instead of develop uh, these uh, singular extensions, to take all the requirements coming out of these groups and combine them into a single guidelines update. Um, there is some concern in reaction to that that we uh, might disrupt existing harmonization efforts. Uh, WCAG 2.0 has been a very important base for harmonization uh, of accessibility guidelines. Uh, but it's important to know that even if a WCAG 2.1 were to come out, WCAG 2.0 would still exist and would be a, a viable conformance base. It would simply be a way of providing new guidance for those that wanted to follow the newer guidelines. Um, and then we've also uh, been doing some preliminary thinking about uh, you know, post 2.0 guidelines. Uh, I'm calling it Way 3.0 in this slide. We don't really have a name for it. Um, uh, but you know, we're likely to need new guidelines to address the, the broader set of technologies, the, the new so sorts of user needs, possibly the ability to interface uh, with, with more uh, types of user groups. Um, so, and it takes forever to develop uh, guidelines through the W3C process. So we need to start now if we're going to have the 3.0 guidelines available anytime soon. Um, we've been doing a lot of thinking about how to integrate these guidelines uh, more tightly, so integrate content authoring with tool support user agent requirements. Um, so uh, you know, instead of having uh, you know, three interrelated guidelines, maybe have one set of guidelines that speaks more directly that, uh, to, to the common set of needs. Um, that might address the problem of accessibility support. It might also be really complex. Um, so, uh, but, but we do have a feeling that we need to come up with a different structure for the 3.0 guidelines and, and, and want to think through how that's going to look. Um, we do need solid guidance for technology developers as well. Um, and uh, since we're revisiting the structure, um, this gives us the opportunity to address uh, you know, other things such as the fact that uh, it, when we're creating a guideline that can be applied to all websites, how do we address the needs of specific communities like digital publishing or education as well. Um, so we might be able to find ways to do that in the structure of the 3.0 ones if we consider it. All of this needs uh, stakeholder representation. We're only as good as the people who participate. Um, so uh, we're, we're welcoming participants. We've been working on ways to in, in, increase the, the ways that people can participate in the WOOCAG working group. Um, there, there's a page uh, uh, linked on the slide for how to join. Uh, we really do need to broaden participation. And just as Jensen stands up, I'm at my end. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't orchestrate that. <laughs> uh, we've got time for one or two questions. Um, how does it fit with the Internet of Things? We've been giving some thought to uh, what are the accessibility considerations of Internet of Things or Web of Things. Um, we, we have some ideas. Uh, don't don't really know. Uh, you know. Ultimately, I think that there's that's going to be something that's going to need to be addressed in technology guidelines. Um, I, I personally think that there's going to be needs for some some uh, APIs for for interfaces because. Uh, uh, I think one big thing about Internet of Things is that you'll want to be able to control a device from a different device than the manufacturer expected. I think that's going to be a big problem we're going to want to solve. Um, but we're still exploring uh, that. It's, it's kind of in its infancy, but it, it's something that's very much on our radar. Uh, let's see if anyone else has a question and then you can come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyone else? Quick question? What would be an extension, or what are other ways of sort of extend, extending or um, increasing the functionality within the tech? One, uh, one particular um, issue is this notion of compliance not at the page level, but at the system level. So um, an entire web 
website fulfilling all of the requirements of WCAG rather than each page having to fulfill the, the checklist? Is, what, yeah. Where do you think that is going to? Uh, I, I think that's another question that, that we definitely want to explore in the 3.0 space. Uh, in, in WCAG 2.0, the unit of conformance is a web page. We definitely know that that's not working <laughs> for everybody. Um, uh, and, and probably in the 2.1 guidelines, we couldn't radically change things enough to, to move away from that. But in 3.0, that's definitely something we'd want to take a fresh look at. And I, I think the thoughts about looking more systemically are, uh, are very interesting. We'll need to think through how to make them work. Uh, uh, in, unless we change uh, courses dramatically, um, we have operated under requirements of sort of testability that have been uh, a bit of a constraint. We'll, we'll have to look through what are going to be the constraints that we will and will not accept for future work. Uh, but you know, within the context of wanting to meet needs like that. Perfect. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, let's thank Michael. <laughs> now, next up is a paper, a communication paper called Development Technologies Impact and Web Accessibility. And I was all excited to read off a full list of names using my Portuguese pronunciations. But there's only one person presenting, so that makes it easier uh, in some respects. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Carlos Duarte from uh, the Universidade de Lisboa. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, you can try reading the, the other names. Uh, I can give you 30 seconds for that if you want to. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, a work done uh, together with Luis Carrizo and several of uh, our students. And uh, what we, uh, well, I guess there's been a lot of motivation for what we have done uh, in this work. Uh, during this morning and in the, in the previous presentation. So basically, uh, we now have a lot of research work on how to make uh, the web more accessible. We have a lot of guidelines, we, we have legislation, but uh, what still happens is that the, the web moves too fast and the accessibility is most of the times left behind. Uh, so, uh, for instance, uh, you, for the well, several, several years now, you see responsive design where uh, content adapts to devices, uh, it can happen, you have solutions uh, having that on the client, uh, on the server, but uh, apparently it uh, will adapt to everything but the user, uh, which is uh, quite a shame. Uh, so uh, this means what? This means that uh, we do have a lot of technology going on, uh, technology for client, technology running on the browser, technology running uh, on the server. But what we don't know, and that's what we uh, set up to, to try to find out, is will some of these technologies lead to more accessible web pages or not? So this is what is being used out there to produce a lot of the pages that we see. Uh, but will any of these technologies uh, provide us with more accessible web pages than other technologies? So this is what we try to, to find out. So what did we do? Well, we crawled the web, uh, we evaluated, automatically evaluated the accessibility uh, of the pages that we crawled, and we tried to uh, figure out what technology was uh, behind it. So how did we do this? Uh, we picked a, a crawler, Crawler4j, uh, gave it uh, some uh, seeds, four seeds, uh, alexa.com, wikipedia.com, uh, there's a bug in that slide, moz.com, top 500, and uh, sap.pt, which is uh, one of Portuguese uh, websites with a, a lot of pointers. And we collected uh, for each of the URL that we visited the first web page uh, in that uh, URL. Then we evaluated its accessibility. We used our uh, automatic evaluator, QualWeb. Uh, it does WCAG 2.0 evaluation on post-processing, so uh, it loads the page and then evaluates the result instead of evaluating just uh, the source code. And we computed uh, three metrics, uh, a conservative metric, metric uh, which just uh, uh, divides the number of uh, techniques that passed by all the techniques that were signaled, uh, the optimistic uh, device pass plus warnings uh, from all, and the strict me metric uh, which ignores warnings and just divides the pass uh, for the passes and the fails. Then, to determine uh, which technology was used to uh, develop the web pages, uh, we uh, picked a, it's a, a Chrome extension called Wapalizer, 
uh, but it's open source, so uh, we got the code and we run it as a script uh, on our web server. And uh, we collect it. Uh, it Popolizer uh, can give us uh, up to 51 supported categories and a lot of technologies inside of those categories. We uh, focused on four of those technologies, uh, programming languages, web frameworks, JavaScript frameworks, and content management systems that were used to produce uh, the web pages. Then we analyzed uh, the data, of course. Uh, for this, we considered only uh, uh, technologies that were represented in at, l at least 15 uh, of the domains that we visited. Uh, we compared uh, the accessibility score of each one to the average score, and we also then did a comparison inside uh, of each of the, the categories. So what did we find out? Uh, at the time of writing uh, this paper, uh, we had gone through uh, 1,669 uh, domains, so we collected uh, all those pages, and uh, the ones that had uh, at least uh, the, the technologies that were present in at least 15 of the pages uh, were uh, four programming languages. Uh, we had Java, Ruby, and PHP, PHP being the most represented one we, in uh, 450 uh, sites. Uh, web frameworks, uh, we had ASP.NET, Ruby on Rails, and Bootstrap, with Bootstrap being the most represented one with 179 uh, pages. For JavaScript frameworks, we had five different JavaScript frameworks, jQuery, Modernizer, MoTools, Prototype, and RequireJS. Uh, jQuery was by far the most used one, 744, so almost half of the pages. And uh, in what regards content management systems, we had Drupal, Joomla, and WordPress, with WordPress with 194 uh, pages being uh, the most representative one. So, what results did we find? Uh, well, the overall accessibility for those almost uh, 1,700 pages uh, for the strict metric, the one that ignores warnings, uh, was uh, 0.602. And uh, we had six technologies uh, significantly um, above that, uh, that value. Uh, so Drupal was the one with the highest average, uh, 0.698. Then we had Bootstrap with 0.676, uh, uh, Modernizer with 0.645, WordPress 0.636, uh, PHP 0.630, and jQuery 0.624. So these uh, six uh, technologies were the ones that represented, uh, that, uh, were, uh, that we found that were significantly uh, above uh, the average uh, value uh, for uh, the whole set of pages that we collected. Looking uh, at uh, the um, inside each category, what did we found for programming languages? Uh, Ruby uh, was the one with the highest average, followed by PHP and uh, Java, but uh, significant differences were only found between Ruby and Java, so uh, pages built with uh, Ruby uh, tend to be more accessible than pages uh, that resort to, to Java. Looking at uh, the web frameworks, uh, Bootstrap was uh, the one with, uh, which generated more accessible pages, uh, followed by Ruby on Rails and ASP.NET. Our findings were that uh, pages built with ASP.NET are less accessible than both with, built with both Bootstrap and Ruby on Rails. So stay away from ASP.NET if you want to uh, build accessible content. Uh, regarding the JavaScript frameworks, um, there were no significant differences. Uh, so RequireJS and Modernizer were the ones with uh, higher accessibility, followed by jQuery, MoTools, and Prototype, but the differences were not significant uh, to find, uh, were not uh, high enough to find any significant uh, results. But uh, in content management systems, we once again found significant results. So Drupal was the one uh, with uh, which uh, led to higher accessibility, uh, followed by WordPress and Joomla, but the significant difference that we found in, in our analysis is that pages built with Drupal are more accessible than pages built with uh, WordPress, okay? Uh, remember that WordPress was one uh, that al also had uh, high accessibility, so what we are saying here is that Drupal leads to higher accessibility than WordPress. We, don't, we are not saying that WordPress leads to pages with low accessibility. 
Okay, so uh, trying to summarize uh, our findings. So technology matters, uh, definitely. Uh, so we, we can see that uh, for uh, every category, we have pages uh, resulting in higher accessibility if we found, uh, if we use some technology than uh, if we use other. And uh, the choices that technology providers make uh, do really have an impact uh, on the outcome of the produced uh, content uh, on, on the on sites that use them. Uh, if, for instance, we look at Bootstrap, uh, we can find that many of uh, its components include ARIA markup, and Bootstrap is one of the technologies that lead to, uh, higher, uh, uh, to more accessible pages. The same for Drupal. Uh, since uh, version, version 7 of Drupal, uh, the core follows, everything in its core follows WCAG and ATAG 2.0 uh, guidelines. So they are complain, compliant to, to the guidelines, and uh, this results in more accessible uh, websites. Okay, so. Uh, this is really important. I think it's good to know for people that want to produce uh, accessible websites. Uh, it's also good to know for technology providers uh, so that they understand that they can make a difference if they choose to. So, uh, What we want to do uh, in, the, in the future, basically we want to, to increase uh, our sample at least uh, threefold. Uh, so this will allow us to look into further categories, analyze more technologies inside each category. Uh, we want to look at uh, how uh, technologies from uh, both categories uh, cross uh, and influence each other. Uh, we want to perform uh, specific analysis uh, for different techniques uh, of uh, WCAG just to understand uh, if uh, which uh, techniques uh, are uh, better handled by different technologies. And uh, ideally, we would like to try to understand uh, how the profile of developers that choose to uh, use one language over the other uh, influence these results. So uh, we don't really believe that Java is uh, per se uh, a worse choice in accessibility terms, but perhaps it's a question of developers that use Java uh, that lead to these results. So uh, this is something that's purely speculation. So uh, once again, uh, thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, let's, go. let's take a look. Let's take a couple of questions, please. Yeah. So that's why PHP is higher. Um, I, the PHP is just a stream concatenation. I mean, it's nothing major. Um, so I'm wondering, did you go through the results and kind of say, well, it, this is probably high because of this? Like, modernizer is also one that you kind of throw in there because it makes it more HTML5. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't uh, looked at the results like that uh, so far. Uh, what we did uh, only was just drop. Uh, in, in this analysis, uh, the, the, the pages that uh, were uh, cross, uh, using cross technologies, so uh, we, uh, for the ones that uh, in, each category, in each category used more than one technology, we dropped the, dro those from the analysis. But we didn't have a chance yet to look, and we want a higher, sam uh, higher sample to, to do that kind of, uh, of analysis, definitely. You're, uh, you're, teasing, you're teasing us for a paper for next year, I hear. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, talk, <laughs> one more question, please. No, and for
unfortunately not. Uh, so we we had just uh, uh, that uh, Wapalizer uh, extension uh, looking at the technology, so we don't, uh, and for this amount of pages, uh, we have no idea really who developed uh, the, the, those websites. Uh, but this is something that we would really love to, to look into, so we will do some uh, interviews, uh, talk to some developers, and just try to understand. Uh, it will be tough to find a, a representative sample. It will be a lot of work, definitely, but it's something that uh, it's most uh, interesting. So you're, you're going to leave here. You're going to leave here with all these new ideas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking uh, Carlos. And we'll turn things over now up to the front.